pray. Lord, your grace has saved us. You sent Jesus Christ throughout this world that we might come and be the person that you need and lead others to Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would go forth into this community and this world and teach them that grace is what we need. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today we want to look at how to live, Galatians 3rd chapter. You know, the two parts to life, life is very simple if we follow what God's teachings are. The first is we have to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. And the next we follow the Word in all that we do. That's called works. Now Paul has a problem in that people try to put works above Jesus. But we are born to do good works. We're born as Christians to do good works. So we need to understand what sin is. First of all, sin is not following the Word of God in the Bible. So we must live by faith as we're commanded. What does that entail? Faith in Jesus as our Savior who died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. If we have Jesus as our Savior and follow the Word of God, we will be living the life that God has planned for us. Now, He has given us instructions in our Bible. Now, it's kind of hard to remember all those, but Jesus narrowed it down for us, gave us a summary to understand in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus says unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto the first. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hold all the law and the prophets. So when we start to do something, all we have to do is determine, is this going to upset God? Is this going to be against God's commandments? Is it going to hurt mankind? So, you know, all of that boils down to that. So when I start to do something, I need to do it as unto God. And if I think I'm going to hurt mankind. I don't need to do it. I'm going to hurt God. I don't need to do it. So we've been saved to do good works. Now, I know that as Christians, it's kind of hard not to have done some good works in your life. But we're not, not works to help us be saved. That's what a lot of people are saying. You know, you've got to have the works in order to be saved. God has shown us the way to good works in the Scriptures. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by this grace from God and is profitable for doctrine. You want to know what the truth is? You check the Bible. It's very simple. And uh, reproof. Sometimes you have to tell people what you're doing is wrong. That's reproof. Correction is when we as Christians go out and start saying things that are wrong. You know, I see it on Facebook all the time. People say, judge not lest you be judged. Well, that's taken out of context. What Jesus is saying when you go to judge and help somebody, make sure you do it humbly and understand that we ourselves are sinners and that we do it in a kind, gentle way. So some people need help in the way and we're called to help people that are gone astray. Well, one thing that I, uh, well, actually for correction, which I'm talking about, people take it out of context, for instructions in righteousness. You want to know what righteous, good, and bad is? You look in the Bible. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. One thing I found interesting in today's session is something I never really thought much about, but Jesus was promised 430 years before God gave them the Ten Commandments. And so they began to put the Ten Commandments over Jesus. Because in Genesis 22, 18, and I see shall all nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. The Jewish people revere Moses. They misunderstand God's intention in giving them the Ten Commandments. So Paul uses the Old Testament, which they revere also, to teach him that the promise of Jesus was given to Abraham before Moses received the Ten Commandments. Actually, they thought that all the rituals they formed were the same as keeping the Ten Commandments. They come and do these rituals, they sacrifice, 
uh, ram, steer, cow, whatever they had in their sacrifice. But God gave us the Ten Commandments to teach us that we need Jesus to save you, Christ. He, you know, if you keep all the Ten Commandments, you can go to heaven. You know, I, I told people that one time. A man came to me after and said, well, you know that it's impossible. I said, yes. <laughs> That's why we need a Savior. You know, you can't keep the Ten Commandments. So don't get excited and think I'm preaching apostasy because if you keep <coughs> the Ten Commandments, you can go right on into heaven. So, you know, if you can keep one of them, you're doing pretty good. So, so we have need of Jesus' saving grace. The Jewish people were indeed familiar with saviors. They had 13 in the book of Judges. And they thought Jesus, he's kind of going to be that warrior king, save us from the Romans. But he set us free from a more powerful enemy, the bondage of sin. He set us free from sin. And Paul goes to a great extent to help us establish a solid foundation on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. As the Bible teaches over and over again, building on a bad foundation will end in disaster. So, first of all, it talks about the truth. It's not the stars, or the horoscope, or the leaves, but God's Word only. God blessed Abraham because of his faith and all his works. Now, he did some magnificent works. But the Bible said, no, he wasn't blessed because of that, but because he followed God's instruction, which is our works to be done. And salvation from Ten Commandments, he says if you're following the Ten Commandments, you're actually asking to be cursed. <clears throat> and the promise of Jesus was 430 years before we had the law. And so the law can't do away with what Jesus is going to do. The Ten Commandments show us sin and why we have need of a Savior. And the sin, I, I like to emphasize this every once in a while. People don't know what sin is. Sin is not doing what God tells us in His Word. So if you read the Word and you go against it, you're living in sin. So Paul is preaching to the four churches of Galatia, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. What are some things people use to tell the future? What about this time of year? What people look at? Are Somebody say the will and work. And the groundhog. Many Christians study the stars and the horoscope. You know, those horoscopes are written so general that they almost fit everybody every time. And some days they hit it right on the head and people get so excited, I need to see what tomorrow's is. And tea leaves. You know, I've never had anybody read tea leaves to me, but they... They do that. And palm readers, to determine our future, you know, they look down and see your lifeline. I used to see if I could find mine in there. But they find the lifeline, how long it's going to be. It's the sun of whichever that line is that goes along. It's going to show you have a long lifeline. So one day, it's on and they'll begin to trust His Word. But the reason for existence can be found in the Old Family Bible which holds all the answers to questions we have about life on earth and life in heaven. Well, the Galatians soon fell into the trap of doing things to prove that they were Christians. And that's one of the dangers of the, I'm trying to prove that I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian because I love Jesus Christ as my Savior. I, I would probably be a better Christian if I did certain things, but not necessarily. So they fell into the trap using other things to guide their future and moved on to many sources and ways not taught in the Bible. And Paul gets on in the first chapter, the first verse of the third chapter of Galatians. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. He said, you've seen Jesus Christ died. Why are you moving on to other things? Unless we stay with the Word of God, we will find ourselves not as strong as we need to be when confronted with temptation and other people's false teachings. Remember, we have been crucified in Christ, gained eternal life, but we can be, easily begin to add or take away from the Word which says that the most important thing is Jesus Christ. And Paul asked them, said, when did you receive the Holy Spirit? When did people receive the Holy Spirit? 
when they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's not some work. I'm going to dig a ditch for somebody, but that's not going to give me the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes when I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. And he asked them that same question. My goodness, folks. He said, This only what I learned of you, receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. And of course, we know faith comes from hearing the hearing of the Word of God. We must do answer the same question. We receive the Holy Spirit by accepting Jesus as Savior. Or did some ritual we did give it to us? Do we believe we'll be filled more with the Spirit of man, such as lighting a candle, carrying a certain type of beads, than by praying and studying the Word of God? A lot of people do these things. You know, they go and light a candle, they carry beads, and all these things. But study and pray to God. And then a lot of churches, you know, they have these things that they feel superior on them. They drink no coffee, they have no piano, no pants. These rituals to deny ourselves, these are pretty easy to follow. So we can be patting ourselves on the back if we do these things and make us feel superior when actually they're not even in the Bible. So foolish, all these things you do to make you perfect. Are you foolish, have begun in the Spirit, and are yet now made perfect by the flesh? He says, Jesus makes us perfect. Well, you going to think you can't be perfect unless you do all these other things. He says, I'm so disappointed finding you doing other things will add nothing but put you on the wrong path in life. What can we do that make us more perfect than what God has done through Jesus Christ our Savior? Many Christians start out strong, but don't know the Bible, so they fall to ignorance and to rituals. He says, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? In Luke 9, 62, and Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. We go forward with Jesus. We don't look back at what we were doing before. So what is it that has persuaded you to give up so much freedom, love, eternal life, comfort, and guidance, and care by turning to other devices? It's not too late to turn back if this is what you do. Do you have faith in the laws or in Jesus? Or in Jesus and God's power and God's word? He says in the fifth verse, He therefore that minister you the Spirit and work of miracles among you, doeth it by the works of the law? Can you find somebody that's doing miracles because they're doing works? He said, well, let's look at Abraham. For he asked, boy, Abraham did some mighty works, didn't he? He took his whole family and moved them bit by bit for years at a time following God's Word. And he sacri almost sacrificed his son. He get ready to sacrifice his son. You know, I, I can't even begin to compare to what all he's done. So let's see what happened to Abraham. Even as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. Not what he did, but his faith. He followed God's command, left his home, sacrificed his son. It has never been by works, but faith in God. The Word of God tells us what to do. Give us his direction for his life. Adam and Eve, what kind of works did they do? <laughs> what, was, what happened when they didn't follow the Word of God? All of a sudden, that cushy life of sitting down by the river, eating from the trees, was gone. So if we don't follow God's word, we're asking for destruction. So we find that uh, how far can our faith reach? How far can our faith reach? And it tells them they first, and the scripture foreseeing that God has justified the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, and these shall all nations be blessed, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Abraham touched the entire world through his faith. Now our faith is helping us to touch to a lot of people in Africa, to the uh, Oasis Baptist Church, where they're baptizing dozens and hundreds are coming. We're touching around the world our faith because we believe that Jesus Christ told us in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, 
says, Go ye there and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I can commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. So that's what he called us to do. And we're reaching out. We, we give to Lottie Moon and to uh, that other lady. <laughs> What's her name? Annie Armstrong. Yeah, Annie Armstrong. We give those offerings. And they reach all the way around the world. And so we're being blessed by that. And faith in Jesus is how we're all justified. All nations are blessed through Jesus' death and resurrection. Looking for blessings? Walk by faith and not by sight. If we do not walk by faith, we're seeking curses. God said, I put before you blessing and curses. What do you want? What do we want? I want blessings. I tell them right away, I don't know curses. I have enough people around me that want to give me the good stuff. So, he tells us, salvation from the Ten Commandments instead receive curses. For as me as are of the works of the law are only cursed. The word is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident the just shall live by faith. I hope that you make that your goal is to live by faith. Faith in God, faith in His Word. First of all, we're not saved by works, but faith in Jesus. Not following commandments of the Bible will bring consequences. However, we're not justified by works, but by faith in God through Jesus Christ. We can be forgiven when we do wrong. Isn't that wonderful? But remember, the just shall live by faith. Well, there's tragedy of doing our own thing without Jesus. And he tells us in the 12th, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. If we live by the faith, he's going to judge us honestly if they're in heaven. He's going to find us short of the glory of God. That's what Romans 3.23 tells us. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why we need a Savior. So if I'm going to work my way into heaven, uh, one of the things we know is, can we ever work enough? When do we know we've done enough? So, we're going to find that Jesus has redeemed us from the curse, as we find in the 13th verse. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. The Hebrew people believe you're suffering the curse of sins of your life if you hung from a cross. Well, Jesus hung from a cross for all our sins, and we need to give Him the praise and the glory. Well, we find that Abraham blessed all nations, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Salvation is the only way through Jesus. Jesus tells in John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man come to the Father except by me. Faith is a victory that overcomes the world. The promise of Jesus we're going to find was 430 years before we had the Ten Commandments. The question if the law was so good, why send Jesus? What can break God's promises? Nothing. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet it be confirmed, no man disannulled, for it there too. You know when you get a title and go down and get notarized, nobody can change that. But nobody can change what God has promised us through Jesus Christ. Although a lot of people try to do that. They try to disannul. But, you know, I've gone and take the title down there and had no rights. It comes to mind. Nobody can do anything with it. Who was the promise first given to? Abraham. Abraham. Now, to Abraham, the seed where the promise is made, he said not unto seeds as many, but as one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. There's only one seed that came out of Abraham that's good. You know, we're going to be fighting against the children of Abraham, but we're spiritual children. We're not physical children that doesn't give us anything. We might be direct descendants, as some people trace all the way back to Abraham, that would not get us into heaven. 
See, the Jewish people believe that because they're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and all those, that they're going into heaven anyway. But the Bible tells us differently. How many years was the promise of a Savior given for the Ten Commandments? He tells us this. And this I say that the covenant was confirmed before God in Christ. The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. We cannot make that promise null and void. The Ten Commandments didn't do that. They only pointed their school teacher. You know, you remember these school teachers? Anybody remember the senior school teachers? Well, the Ten Commandments is a school teacher to teach us some of the sins that we're up against. And we find that, for if the inheritance be of the law, is no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham a promise. The law is not part of a promise of faith in Jesus. This is what God gave Abraham, the Ten Commandments, to show us what we're doing wrong, why we need a Savior. Wherefore then serveth the law? What good is the law? Moral compass. He was added because of transgressions to the seed should come to whom the promise was made and was ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. Gave to Moses to help us in our daily living, to recognize sin, help us realize we have need of a Savior. Now a mediator is not a mediator one, but God is one. Nor we have a mediator, Moses was a mediator. Now Jesus, who is God, is also the mediator between God and man. Can anything break God's promise? Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Is the law compete with God's promise? A lot of people may be that way today. But God saw man's estate and saw the need of a Savior. How many of us are under sin? Romans 3.23 says, All I have sinned come short of the glory of God. And how the people in the olden days justified. They're justified by faith also. And he said, But the scripture has concluded all other sin, but the promise of faith by Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up in the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Just as Abraham was justified, justified by faith, also were the older people they will see the righteousness of Jesus. Their faith was honored by Jesus' death on the cross. Man's estate was the lost one. Before we had Jesus, we were given the law to direct our ways. Our final destination was still based on faith, which was not settled for those of old until Jesus came. And it says, God, we righteousness when Jesus came. He said in the 24th verse, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under schoolmaster. The law was our teacher, showing us how far from righteousness we were and how we need a Savior. We saw our hopeless estate when we tried to keep those laws. Can you write them down and take all ten out and see how many you break tomorrow <laughs> before you get too far? He says, the promise of a Savior will make us righteous. We're no longer bound up. We're set free when we believe John 3.16. Faith in Jesus is the way to being a child of God. For you are children of, the, of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized in Christ have <coughs> put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. We have the righteousness that Jesus gives. He is our first fruit. We should strive to hit the mark. Be the Christian He wants us to be. No one can be denied from becoming a Christian if they believe in Jesus. Make no difference who you are. There's only one way. And He tells us in the 29th verse, And if you be Christ, then your Abraham seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs to the throne and the wonderful eternal life promised by God. The truth is the Bible, not the stars, the horoscope, the leaves, but God's word only. 
God blessed Abraham because of his faith, not his works. Now remember how many works Abraham did, moved his family, oh, so many times. And salvation from the Ten Commandments is destruction. The promise of Jesus was 430 years before we had the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments show us sin and why we need a Savior. 